Okay, welcome back to the show. And I have a returning guest from way, 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 way back in the day when I was recording the podcast on a phone in my kitchen on Skype on an iPhone, I think five. You know, I was I was getting away with it at the time, but I said I had to get this man back on in a kind of a, I guess, a fancier setup. I'm in a conservatory now. That's actually a child's playroom, but you can't see that at the moment. And yes. he's still got his lovely background there as well. Yes. Mr. Dan Madigan, uh, the writer of See No Evil, ex-writer in WWE. How are you today, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you and how's the viewing audience? Hope everyone's doing well out there. Going good, going good. I'm just having a couple of... Uh, Brewskis tonight. My uh, base. My, my base is to get the uh, conversation enlightened. Yeah, my my son just turned three today, so that's the celebration that's going on today. Slancha, slancha. Look, man. If people want to look back at our previous episodes, like we're going to talk about certain things today that we covered, but I I found that back then the audience was a bit lower, and now it's a bit higher. So I think people really yes, yeah. would like to hear what you have to say. Highbrow, highbrow. Yeah, absolutely. We're, okay. we're not, we're not where we want to be yet, but we're getting there. And when I say we, I'm actually just talking about me because I do you, everything. But you're the royal we. I'm just a sir. <laughs> I'm gonna your ascension to the throne. Let me help you push you up there. Yeah, okay. Because I know you've got some great stories, and that pretty much is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about your time in WWE. I know you absolutely love talking about it. You oh, never yeah. get asked about WWE, man. Well, it's funny. If you look, I mean. The farther I get away, sometimes it becomes like someone else's life. You know, it's yeah. like people will say things. I read about this and that happened to you. I go, I, I can't remember. You know, <laughs> I go, I guess it did, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was it was, it was, was an adventure. I mean, starting off, when I got the job, when I was hired, I was basically told, um, this is the hottest job there is. There's no days off. You work seven days a week. You're on constant call. Uh, you go to travel with Vince and you live, move to Stanford, and it's, and it's an amazing turnaround rate. I, and I said to myself, I'll do it. I'm on the right home, I'm going, what the hell's wrong with me? But, you know, when they threw that gauntlet down, I was like, and Stephanie had come out to meet me to Los Angeles. She'd read some stuff I did. She really dug it. So she came, flew out to meet me. And uh, that was how she started the conversation. And I was like, okay, it sounds like a challenge. And I, I accepted it. You know, looking back, I, I, I must have a screw loose, but I think look and overall looking back, it was a, a good thing I did. You know, it was an amazing year. Year, I mean, I worked for a year. I worked for several months prior to going there for the movie and whatnot and talking to people. I worked for a full year. Then afterwards, I worked with a lot of wrestlers on the QT, on the down low. Yeah. Oh, so, but overall, like two and a half years work with the company and the movie, the sequels and all this stuff. And it was it was a learning curve. It really was. I got to say one thing. Coming out of there, because I've been in Hollywood for years, but coming out of working with events, you work for events, you can work for anybody in Hollywood. I don't care what producer it is, what production company, what director. You you were in that lion's down with Vince, and that's, that's the perfect training ground for any place in Hollywood. Did you learn a lot there, looking back on it? I think I did. I think I, I mean, I went in, like everyone else, you went in with preconceptions of what the business is because you watch wrestling as a fan and as a writer, I'm a storyteller. So, you know, I write screenplays and whatnot. And, and so there's a, there's a structure of storytelling, even though it's wrestling, whether it's a stories, whatever, a graphic novel, there's that structure for telling a story. And, you know, that doesn't really deviate a lot. But once you get there, you see there's a different culture, different world behind it and stuff. And one thing that I didn't want to get stuck in and I don't out here this world of politics, and it seems like you can't escape that. It seems like where you go, whether it's in Hollywood or there's TV or movies or wrestling, whatever it is, this is type of subtextual game. Of, and I just wanted to get in right and do the job. I mean, I had so much hassle just writing. I didn't have time for all the BS behind the stuff. You know, when I left work, I wanted to go home. You know, I just I tried, I tried to go home and sleep, so I didn't wasn't really involved with that stuff. But you know, you learn a lot. I learned a lot from Vince. I learned mostly, believe it or not, I learned a lot from Paul Heyman. I think I learned more from Paul Heyman than anybody because I'd come up with these crazy scenarios, which in my mind weren't crazy. You know, they were, you know in, in the world of pro wrestling, like you can get away with stuff. But I come up with these scenarios and Paul would hear him out and he goes, okay, okay, that's crazy. That's insane. That's not going to work. But I'll tell you why. And he said he'd break everything down. He like, I like this. I like that. And, I'll, and so he would break things down and he would explain it in such a way that in that world it made sense. 
And it makes yeah. sense that no matter what story you're telling, you're always protecting the business, making the boys look strong, hiding weaknesses, putting people over. So that was something I learned a lot from Paul. And I've taken those elements, storytelling elements, I brought them back up to Hollywood too. Um, so I think it's much work for me. Can you explain to me, uh, when you went to meet with Stephanie that time, you said that she had re uh, read some of your pieces. What were yeah. those pieces and what was that quote that she said? Because it was great. Oh, well, um, let me trim it. I had met with, um, prior to meet Stephanie, I had met, the WWE had set up a production company in Beverly Hills. They wanted to make movies. Yeah. And I was with ICM at the time. There's the two big stu um, production um, management companies, the CAA. And ICM and ICM had me as a client. So they had sent what to do is you get a sample script. They, someone likes one of your scripts, uh, uh, an action script, horror script. They send it out to different people. And they sent one of my scripts. It was a it was an action script to the WWE. And the production people there, the uh, people behind that company, the producers, they read it, they liked it. They said they brought me in to chit chat, and they said, "Oh, we like your writing style. This is something we see we can work with you in the future with." And I said. Sure, but you know, I hear that all the time. People give you a yeah. BS off. No, okay, whatever. And but then um a couple weeks later, my manager called me. He says, Hey, listen, we'd like you to go and pitch an idea to the WWE, you know, uh, for a horror movie. I said, Okay, you know, give me a couple weeks. I mean, you know, I come up with something and go, when do they want to hear me? He said, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> thanks for the heads up, you know. But my manager at the time. Mason Novick, and he was nominated for Academy Award for producing Juno. He was like, ah, oh, you work good under pressure. You'll, you'll be fine. And so that's how he left it. So I went down on a Tuesday, and I was like, geez, I, I didn't really have an idea, to be honest. And on the, driving down from my house to Santa Monica, having a cigar, I said, I'll come, I'll come up with something. I'll think of something, right? And I always have, every writer, I think, has a, some sort of idea in the back of the head for a horror story or something. And I was tooling around an idea. And I more or less went to the pitch meeting to the, the producers who are in Vince's W Studios. And I sort of ad lib, but I was watching, you know, where they were going. I was trying to watch their faces and stuff. And knowing that the story is based on one of the wrestlers. It was going to be based on Kane. You know, yeah. quite so, so the story is going to be based upon him. So everything that revolved around that persona, that character. And I had a strong idea where I wanted to go with it. And I'm in pitching the story to this producer who's literally standing there stone faced. Not even a, a motion, no emotion. It's like I'm on Easter Island. The guy wouldn't give me any fuck, and nothing. He just sat in there like, and so I'm doing the whole pitch, this and this, and ba 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 ba, and I, you know, here's the story. It's, it's a big explosion, all the song and dance. Then ta da! And he doesn't say a word. I'm like, there's another job I don't get. But after about five seconds, he goes, Jesus Christ, Vince is gonna f and love this. And he goes, That's can you write? Can you give us a treatment? I go, yeah. And I forgot half what I said, by the way. I was, you know, picking it up. At, at, in the moment. I was in the moment. So I go, okay, I remember the, this This happened, this happened, this happened. So I went back and I wrote a treatment. Most treatments, seven, eight pages, ten pages. That's a treatment, you know, in Hollywood. Yeah. I decided, I, I did like a 57-page treatment. I basically wrote the entire thing out. It was like a novella with explosions and dialogue. And it just kept moving and moving and moving. Because in my mind, if they liked the treatment, I was just going to expand that. I wasn't going to write it. Here's, here's the gist of what the story. I'll just expand it. So I write this treatment. I send it off to the production company. They sent it to Vince on a Thursday. And then Monday they said, we're making the movie. Which, like, wow. I mean, I was, wow. So that was like, that was came out of nowhere. And in the meantime, I'm on track to make this film. Um, I'm talking to these producers and... We started talking about the wrestling show, Raw, SmackDown, my love for wrestling. I wanted to be pro wrestler when I was a kid. I grew up with it in the Northeast. You know, I grew up with WWF. Yeah. Um, so they said to me, they go, you know more about wrestling than anyone we know. You know, in their little world, they said, oh, I'm a big, big fan. And they said, would you like to write for the show? I said, people write that shit? They go, yeah, sure, sure. Come up, come up with an idea or something. Come up with any idea and, you know, see what you think. You know, come up with some ideas. So I started watching the show again, but this time more intent, more like really – not just to show watching structure wise, story wise. Mm -hmm. And I sat and down. Dan, just, just to be clear, when you started watching that show, and we're going to make this clear mm -hmm. from the start, this was around the time that Katie Vick oh. stuff was happening, and which you had nothing to do with, no, which nothing, I put that out there. Nothing, but it, I, nothing to do. I started watching the show. I, I was actually taking notes, physical yeah. notes. 
And I said, because I, I, you know, I always, I knew the show, but I didn't really sit down and study the show. Yeah. So I started studying the show, my little pad of paper, my pens, and they do the Katie Vick line. What then, if I, it, it gets to the culminates where Triple H dressed as Kane goes to the funeral home and, and I'm, and I'm in shock. I go, this is absolutely, um, it, it was mind blowing how, not just bad, not just bad taste, bad, but everything bad about it. Just bad. It was, and I said to myself, with the exception of, I guess, child snuff pornography, these guys are doing anything. So I said, yeah. that's, they lowered the bar. They didn't just lowered the bar, they buried the bar. You Did know. you feel then before you went into that job? Because I know like people would look back on your career and you've suggested controversial things and been involved in controversial moments. Did you feel by watching that that as you say the bar was low and you could kind of pitch or suggest anything to them? Yeah, I did I did. You know, I, I figured, well, these guys will, they'll allow this. But still, I mean, I'm a I'm a horror guy. I write horror films, I'm known in the horror community and stuff. You still yeah. you want you still want to elevate the product, you know. You don't want to go for the cheap thing. It's like like I was, I was very close with Toby Hooper, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Toby, yeah, you know, you know, so he was like my dad. He used to call me his son. So I knew Toby. For you we were very, very, very close. And you learn from Toby is this shock and suspense, and shock wears up, but suspense builds. And I, I took that mindset to the wrestling. You know, the shock will wear up, but to build the suspense of a story means something because it's, it's, it's a bigger payoff. And it doesn't always work in wrestling, you know, because at the end of the day, we get people in the ring to wrestle. But leading up to it, you want to build some story, something organic around it. Of course. Yeah. And so I had some ideas. I said, well, this is the world of pro wrestling. I mean, I grew up watching wrestling. I grew up watching the Santo films in Mexico. I used to get, you know, tapes when they were made as Samson films, you know, they were dubbed over and stuff. So, and wrestling is a world of the suspension of disbelief. If you watch rest, if you watch a show where a guy can take a chair, and bludgeon someone with it and not get in trouble. And then so you you open up for everything, you know. So yeah, they they they, they fight in the ring, they whatever they do outside the ring, and everything in that world exists. So I said, well, let's push some storylines, you know. If I'm a pro wrestler, if I can't push pro wrestling, why am I here? So I went into the idea of I'm gonna try to push the story as much as I can to see where it breaks. Um, if I don't, why'd you hire me? I said that one time I go to five Vince, you know, if you can't, if I can't push the envelope, why am I here? You know, you can get the other writers will sit there, you know, but I want to see how far I can go. And I think um, it hopefully I thought it would make the product better, make me a better writer. But still, you want to gauge what people are going to accept or not accept, you know, and wrestling is the type of thing was the type of thing where you could sort of like parody what's going on in society and would work. I don't I definitely know today, today's climate, nothing I did would go to nothing would go, to, go over. Not, I mean, did yeah, it go, yeah, yeah. I would just yeah. I'd be persona non grata. But um, so. Back to the guys who ran the company, the production company, they said, Why don't you come up with an idea? Come up with some storylines, we'll submit them to Stephanie McMahon. Because she was at the time, she was the head of creative. Yeah. Uh, for SmackDown. I said, What the hell, right? So I'm watching this Katie Vick thing, which was terrible. And I went out, and here's the crazy thing, which I went on before I said up, to, up after I left the business. I thought that was a terrible, terrible storyline. I, I just, it was the low point for storytelling. And then some people would write about me and they would credit me has created that storyline. And I'm like, that's the, no, I don't know. Maybe they saw my name in an in in article with that, but, you know, instead of doing due diligence, it, people, I hate that story. They've probably they, seen it in a list of controversial yeah. things. And they saw my name, they put they put it together. It's like, well, I can ruin my own career. I don't need anyone's help to ruin my career. I've done a great job of my own. <laughs> they don't help me. So that kind of, that sort of drove me crazy. But when I met with Stephanie, I said, you know, I got to really see what I can do to impress her. So, I've always liked storytelling in serial form, like the old serials, you know, from Saturday mornings and stuff. So my idea was, was to create a, f a faction of um, wrestlers from South America, different parts of South America, ex-convicts, mercenaries, people off death row, all wearing masks. And they're all masked. They're all coming up to SmackDown for their leader. The leader is called the Beast. And they're going to lay waste because they want the beast to take over because he, he's going to possess all the souls of the people in SmackDown, which is what people do in wrestling, you know. You know, you know. Yeah, of course. That's, that's, there's nothing else inside that world. So I came up with this crazy scenario. It took like a – it was like a six-month arc, too. I, I mean, I didn't really know at the time how they stru structured it, but I placed everything like weekly, monthly, how the payoff is. And and the, the beast comes. His minions come. It's a, it's a fucking free-for-all a battle royale at mass wrestlers. And Stephanie McMahon's soul gets possessed. Go figure. 
you know, go figure. And by the so he uh, he he has Stephanie McMahon's soul, and she she's tied she's tied to the ropes, much like the Exorcist and Triple H is fighting, and Vince McMahon fights his way through this group of masked wrestlers with holy water. And he's throwing the holy water like Exorcist. The power of Vince compels you. The power of Vince compels you. And the ring is levitating and stuff. So I went all out. I went all out batshit crazy. So I wrote this scenario. I'm thinking, oh, they'll never go for it. Man. It's yeah. there's nothing to lose. So I sent it into the to the production people. They go, holy shit, this is crazy. So they said to Stephanie, she was, I got to meet this guy. So she flies out to meet me. And that's where the initial conference, she was, this is crazy, but we love the writing. We love the storytelling, the whole scope of the thing. And that's when they decided, you know, we'd like to bring you on board. Bah, 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 bah. It's, it's it's seven days a week. It really is. You, you know, there's no days off. Yeah. Yeah. Because you do a show Monday, you know, live Monday, Tuesday was taped. Then you do like the shows Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, conference calls, traveling, pay-per-view. So you're always working. And I said, okay, I'll do it. So Stephanie hired me to write the TV show. And unbeknownst to her, Vince had hired me to write his first movie. So I was the golden boy. I mean, Vince McMahon himself hired me to write his film. Stephanie hired me for the TV show. Neither person could for the other person. So I was the golden child. When I showed up, I was the golden boy. It was lasted yeah. like five minutes. Did you, Do you remember the first time you met Vince and what he Absolutely. said to you? Well, it's funny because I'd seen, like I said, I grew up with Vince McMahon on TV. So you always seen him on TV. Then I ran yeah. to him once as a kid outside. I was waiting to watch The Clash. I'm in Cape Cod Coliseum. I'm waiting in line all day. This is, I didn't know at the time Vince was running that, he was running that territory. He yeah. was running the Cape Cod Coliseum. And I'm in line. This limousine pulls up. And my buddy goes, hey, that, that's that's the guy you watch. I go, that's Vince McMahon. Going to the box office, talking to the box office. Getting, you know, But he was from afar. But you know, this is the guy I watched. I mean, I just watched him like the week before. And this is at a Clash concert in the early 80s. And then come to meet Vince. In his, you know, in the writers' room, he walks in, and it's a, it's a guy with, you know, me watching 30, 40 years. It's an imposing thing. This is like watching like a character actor or a fan, you know, a fan of watching someone come to life. And he yeah. shakes his hand and he says, you know, we're gonna make a lot of money with this character. You know, the Jacob Goodnight. We're gonna make a lot of money. I said, I hope so. I hope so. You know. And so that yeah. it, my initial reaction is like, this is a guy who I'd seen for years and years, and now. We're on a one on one relationship, you know, one on him being the boss, me being the surf, but still, you know, it was a whole different dynamic then. Um, so it was, it was something because, like, you know, it's like meeting like someone you, a childhood hero who was, he, he was a childhood hero of mine. Yeah. You know, when, when you talk about Jacob Goodnight, there might be some people that maybe don't know who that is, but that oh. is the, the character. The Kane's character in the movie See No Evil, which you, which you created. Yes. Yeah, um, that's the character's name was Jacob Goodnight. Yeah, and I, I think I got a little picture here because we've we've advanced uh, from the times of the the kitchen table here. I think we've got a little picture. Of him. There he is. There he is. Oh yeah, he's a, the fine looking man. Fine looking. <laughs> but uh, for people that don't know the story, and you know what I'm going to say to you now. No, um, yeah. yeah. When you were working on that movie, you were saying that it was travel. You didn't want to go to Australia to be no. there for the actual film of it, and you were at home, and you received a call about from, was I, it Gregory I, Dark? Yeah, it was at first Gregory Dark, who said, "I think he's a great guy, very smart guy, very very sharp guy." Gregory, you know, he worked yeah. in adult entertainment, did a lot of videos, but he's a very sharp guy, guy, you know. And I got it. I know he contacted me, and I think one of the producers did. It's kind of a blur, but uh, when I was on the road, I. I was in Stanford, Connecticut, and I was basically traveling with Vince for the whole year. And contractually, I could have gone to Australia to watch, be on the filming for the for the movie. I didn't want to be on a plane to Australia. I gotta be honest, I just didn't an eighteen hour flight. I can't handle it. Too you far. Know? I couldn't. I don't like traveling with Vince, you know, around the country, two three hours away. I can't imagine being on a plane that long. I did it for too too long. So I said, you know, if there's a problem, you know, you know. The script had already been rewritten. I'd gone to arbitration, so there's a problem. The script will call me, and there's a problem. The script because um, prior to this, Vince would pull me aside in the writers' room during a writers' meeting. He would he would make suggestions for the movie, and I felt very uncomfortable because I'm in the writers' room. And we're writing about wrestling. We're writing small, Raw, SmackDown, then Heat, Velocity, whatever it was. It was all wrestling, and he would sort yeah. of veer off into the movie. And I thought, and you know, you don't. There's no friends in the writers' room. They really know. And Vince would have these ideas, like you know. Would be great because the Kane character, Jacob Goodnight, is encased in chains. His body's in chains originally. 
just goes when he when he's got the girl locked up. If he was, you know, yanking his chain, you know, and he's yanking his chain, Dan. You get it? I go, yeah. He's yanking his. I go, yeah. He's yanking. we. I get the visual. Yeah. I'm not gonna yeah. work, you know. And, and <laughs> at the end of the day, it's his move. He's paying for it. I could have talked him out of it, uh, but I said no. It's not gonna work. And then I remember getting the call. I forget it was Gregory. Someone got the call. Originally, I actually cut a foot off, but I, originally. Vince wanted to see it's just that similar scene with this girl's trapped. She's trapped upstairs and he has a makeshift cage. And the Jacob Goodnight character unzips his pants. And um and a, a three foot penis comes out. It was actually four foot, but I and that's so outrageous. I made it to three, but it's actually he, he brings out a three foot penis. And I don't know why Vince thought that'd be a good idea. I don't know what he was adamant on having this scene. I don't know what the, did the penis talk, did it detach? I don't I don't know what he thought about it, right? Did it, you know, what's gonna happen? And then I remember speaking to Gregory and it's like, this this, this is not gonna work. <laughs> so, you know, and I remember the producers would show chicken shit to tell Vince it's a bad idea. All except, oh, good idea, Vince. I was like, and I said, no, no, bad idea, bad idea, Vince. And I'm 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 trying to pull people aside, go, someone has to be on my side. This is crazy. And Gregory, I think smart enough, he goes, Vince, I don't know why you want this to happen. What's gonna, what's gonna happen? What do you think is ha- gonna happen? Because it has, has a certain progresses. If anyone's still interested in the story, and this guy pulls his three foot penis out, we're gonna lose the audience. We're gonna lose. Um, we can't get money. Any money, advertisement, nothing. Don't get me wrong. I love a three foot penis story. A good one. I mean, I, I want to see one, but this isn't the story. Didn't really lend itself to it. And finally, we had to convince, you know, Vince, Gregory, myself on one end, more or less, like, hey, at the end of the day, you know, it's, you know, good idea, but it's not for this, not exactly going to work yet. And and I'm saying, this guy's a billionaire. I'm trying to talk this billionaire, billionaire about putting a three-foot penis into a horror movie. What and did was, he say to you? What did he well, say to you? Like, he, he just, he, he, when Vince is adamant about something, it's like it's etched in stone. No, three foot penis is good. No, three foot penis is bad. You know, back and forth. And finally, when we when he realized we're not going to get any advertising, we're going to get maybe NC seventeen rating. I think when he saw what could happen um, to the box office and to the you know what's going to happen, I think okay, that went off. Um, and he realized. I think thank Christ, in you know, the better judgment came over. And there was some times too, like the at the very very ending of the film, I fought with him about something. I fought about something with Vince, and it's like. Um, and the day I said, listen, pick your battles. He's signing your paycheck. You know, if he wants something, just, just do it and stuff. But it was, you know, it was a real eye-opening experience. Not just that, but the whole time I was there. Didn't he say to you, didn't he say to you before as well, it was pick your hill to die on? What was yes, that in reference to? Uh, we Well, we get to a couple of fights. We, um, I created with Kevin Furtick the character Mordecai. Yes, and I, and I really like that. I like Kevin's a great guy, and he really, he really is very good. And he had this religious background. His dad was like a minister, like a Baptist minister, Methodist minister. He was a really in, intense minister. And um, Kevin, this idea about yeah, let's have a religious, religious zealot. Like, we started going back and forth, back and forth, and stuff. And we, yeah, this is interesting, you know. And and so I wanted to, and it really was coming together when we. He's the exact polar opposite of the Undertaker. You know, he's the he's got the white hair, bleached white, wearing the white, but he's a, he's the anti-hero, the you know, he's a, the villainous religious person. And I thought, you know, we're going to Las Vegas for a, a Monday night raw. I said, Vince, give me a camera crew, we'll go on top of a hotel, and we'll we'll cut a promo and we'll you know, we'll pan the, the strip, we'll cut a promo, you know, equating Vegas to Sodom and Gomorrah, whatever it is, something like you know, Babylon in the desert and People losing their souls at quarter of time every time you pull a you know a switch and it really work, would work well together for what we're going to do. He was like, "No, it's not going to work." And I said, "Vince, I think it's going to work." And we started talk, talking Wednesday. We start a proper Thursday, Friday. When it comes to the meeting on like um, Monday morning, I bring it up again, and Vince goes, "God damn it! Don't you know? Can't you pick the hill to die on, Dan? This is I, you know, I said, you know what, Vince, you're right." You're right. You know what? You're, you're the boss. I'm not going to push it. We'll do it the way you want. She just wanted a cold open with the run in and stuff. And then, like I said, it's his company. After the meeting, several people came up to me who were in some of the Hall of Fame. They said, you know, we think we think you are right. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, I, I'm not going to ask for your support because he's the boss. 
and I think in hindsight, like you know, I'm not saying I know more than Vince, but I think for the situation, you're building this religious character, this this whole fervor about like you know he's going to save your soul. You got to cut a promo in Vegas. You're 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 not a casino. You're looking at Babylon in the desert, and I think you know you you can't tease people for weeks and weeks and weeks with these promos and b rolls and not give the guy something to work off. It's um, still but- it's it's still one of the most. Um talked about characters i guess that never really got that push i suppose you know push. it never got the push i don't know i i've heard different conflicting stories and you you know you you hope to think you know did i f up was it my story was was vince was going I don't think so vince was telling taz and cole i mean they he, they would say this is the best stuff we've had written and this this little character and the stuff we're doing and i don't think there was one or two matches didn't really go the way it should have gone. People didn't sell the way it should have sold. And I think um, they didn't really give it enough time to breathe. You know, they wanted lightning in a bottle. And I'm out there with a lightning rod trying to get, you know, attract it, you know, but some, you know, times to breathe and stuff. It's, the whole thing was geared for this guy um, fighting uh, Taker at WrestleMania. That's the whole scenario was just create this character. So Taker's got a, a viable anti-hero to go against. Well, if it's any consolation, people still talk to talk talk about it to this day. You know, oh, well, so that 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 will that will tell you you're on the right track. Like people, I'd see it online every so often. And the Mordecai character would come up on different forms and stuff. Be like, what if this guy actually? What if they went with this? You know, oh, can I... you can can you tell us the story about when you put the the names on the board? Yeah, I knew. Yeah. Um, I know we're in Boston, by the way. It's my hometown. So. It was kind of, um, and I I know I know Vin, I knew Vince for a while, so I knew what he how he thought. So I took a bunch of biblical names, but I like the name Mordecai. It's always been a you know, uh, religious reference. It, it's in the Bible, and it has that type of appellation type of name. It's biblical, like Old Testament crazy. And I wanted this name, so I took a list of names and, and I had a yellow piece of paper and I wrote everything in pencil. I put Mordecai's name in the middle, but bigger than everything else by like you know a half a font bigger. I wrote it up in my hand and. I remember handing it to Vince and go, here's some ideas for names, Vince. Like, you know, the first couple were off, Abner, Jubal, whatever. Vince is going down the list like this. Mordecai. Mort. That means death. I like it. And, and <laughs> I was like, we got it. We got it. And it was um, you know, those those moments or those, those little victories you get and stuff. And like I said, what could have been? I mean, I, I it's taken like the idea too, taken like the idea of like having a religious zealot who is the complete opposite of who he is. Mm-hmm. And I think would have matched up well and stuff. It just if it, if it just had the legs to go, people if they let it if they push it, they should have kept pushing it, you know. And I think um, they get nervous with something. I don't know what happened. Plus, plus there was an incident with Kevin outside of the ring, a little um, dust up in a bar room, which didn't oh, help. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. didn't help either. Talk to me about this. <laughs> the oh. Gene Snitsky. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. I love you know he's, yeah. he's the, you should get him on. You should get him on here. Uh, I'd I'll, love I'll, to. I'd love to. I'll reach out to him. I'll reach out to Gene tonight for you. I love Gene. Uh, yeah. Big cigar smoker too, like I am. Um, it came about. Um, we were doing the angle with uh, Kane. Was first he was uh, attracted to Lita, then he's stalking Lita. He basically yeah. sexually assaults Lita. And I said, there's no way getting around it. I said, yeah. you know, Vince wants Kane, Lita to have Kane's baby. I go, um, that's rape. I'm just letting you know, it's rape. You can't, you can't, you know, there's no way to put it. You know, he goes, he's going to have her, you know, having a woman have your child against her will, hard storyline, really hard to, you know, in that family friendly attitude. I'm like, I don't know if it's going to work. So, <laughs> You know, so I'm trying my best to screw around the things and like, um, and the idea that Kane wants his progeny to live on, you know, his offspring. So he picks Lita, and and then, but I what I did learn from Vince is that at that time Kane was the most hated character you know we had on the roster of Raw. He was like he's stalking this girl. He's basically a monster, sexual molester. And Vince goes, when you get someone that hot, that heated, and just heel so hated, it's easy to turn him like that. Oh, okay. Show me. We bring in someone worse. So when the match starts, Kane is this, you know, hulking rapist monster who yeah. pregnant leader against her will, and he's vilified. But all he wants is a child. 
As the match progresses, Schnitzky comes in, beats down Kane, hurts Lita when she loses the child. So Kane goes from being rapist monster to grieving father. And it's really like in, within half Just an like hour, that. like that. It's like, wow, the whole thing, the dynamic has changed. It's like everything's changed. Now you're seeing a different perspective of this thing. And I think I learned that that does work well, like in film, in a clockwork orange, it works in certain movies where you follow the, you follow the anti-hero. You put him in a situation where, like, he's actually feeling something. You're, you're you're feeling for him and stuff, which is, you know, Hitchcock did it with Frenzy. Like, when you're cheering for the, the villain to get away with it, something wrong. There's something wrong with that. So we, now we're cheering for a guy we hated earlier because the character brought in is worse. And um, we came up with the idea, was it my fault? Uh, yeah, great, great line. Yeah, and um, and he just played it off. I mean, Gene just played it off Greg. Is he really... It's another character that I, you know, I, I he had a good career. I think they should have done so much more with him and stuff because he he played it to the hilt too. He's an opposing guy, big imposing guy, big, big fucking teddy bear, nicest guy in the world. You know, it's the great cat. You know, um, but yeah, I think with someone like Kane, so you need someone that formidable that who can not just physically do it, but have the same intensity. And I think I think Gene worked perfectly for that. You know, he when he came up, he just, he did it great. You, and you ask him to do anything, he would do it. You know, and it worked. Well. He's a natural heel. You know, he's one of these guys. He's a natural heel, and when you work with a heel, it's better. It's easier to tell a story. Yeah, and uh, like that. That that was a crazy storyline because it's, of the way you just said it flipped like that. But that kind of comes back to what you said about the kind of evil genius of Vince McMahon, really, yeah, as well. It really is. I and mean, there were times I'd sit, I talked to Vince, and um, because I'm a historian of wrestling and of history itself. I'm a big of history buff, and time. Yep. These moments when I would get to talk to Vince one on one, and he knew I was a fan of the business, and he would talk to me about like you know his grandfather who started you know or the Gold Dust Trio or Toots Mond and Strangle Lewis, and I knew these names, I knew these people, you know, uh, for reading them. So he he liked to talk to me about this stuff. These moments we had about the business, and I was absorbing it all in and stuff. Um, and he he came to the business when he was a kid, but he flourished within that business. He under, he under, he understood every part of that business. Um, and he created his own empire doing it. You know, you can't fault him for that. It's his, he likes doing it his way. Yeah. It's his company, you know, but I did learn a lot. And I think, um, there were times when, um, he really does at the end of the day, what's going on now, he does care about the fans that I know that I know for a fact. I mean, I remember, um, we did a show in Houston, I think something. Yeah. And, um, there was a whole section of like special needs kids watching the show and um and this is afterwards and i think bruce pritchard had said so well, yeah we have the special needs kids watching the show and bruce i mean vince said he and also sarity stopped him he goes yes they are special it wasn't any bullshit this is just the sincerity of you know these kids and it was and it was like you know um that's 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 another side of vince that i really uh, enjoyed get, getting to know yeah you know? was what like aside from kind of the funny stuff that we're talking about here like when it comes down to the nitty-gritty was some of your most favorite work with eddie guerrero on oh. wwe television yeah you know it's funny because i i could want great eggs i was a i was doing i was approached to do the wrestling book the mondo lucha gogo book while yeah. i was working um harper collins contacted me uh through someone i knew a mutual person to write this book about this year mexican wrestling well, I'm working with Eddie Guerrero. I mean, there's no, I mean, literally, this this is a treasure trove. I mean, this this is dad's Gory Guerrero. His uncle is more or less his uncle is El Santo. So the history is right there. Yeah. So I was I would talk to Eddie a lot, and he and I would talk to Chavo. I had many hours talking. The stories about Chavo Guerrero were amazing. Uh, his older brother Chavo. Yeah. And so me and Eddie became friends, and we would talk. And then Eddie, several times, he came to me. He'd ask me, he "Goes Dan, could you write for me? Could you, you know, write these three, you know, and." And I should, Eddie, what do you want? And I would do stuff on the slide because Stephanie more or less put her flag on Eddie saying, I'll write for Eddie. I'll write yeah. his stuff. And he, he came to me. Um, we, one time I was in Los Angeles. He came to me and he said, please help me. I said, what do you want? So we go back and forth because he, she didn't understand him where he came from. And she was painting him into a car he didn't want to be in. So she would suggest things and he would call me and text me. We'd talk about things. And, you know, I, I gave him different alternatives. You know, you want to make, that's just one thing, but, you know, what would your character do? No matter what I say to you, Eddie, it's you. It's your character. 
It's Latino heat. It's got to be your yeah. organic way of doing something. And then he asked me once we were doing them. Um, we did a show in El, El Paso. And this is when uh, I was working with JBL. And we were doing yeah. this promo. And JBL was talking about the Guerrero family, insulting the Guerrero family, insulting them. Yes. I and think I'm, a lot of people remember that. Yeah. And and I love the Guerreros and I love JBL. And 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 you get pitched. JBL is talking about when people come to America. When you come through Ellis Island legally, you see the boat come from Europe and you see the, the bright eyes of the people wanting to come to America and the immigrants, the legal immigrants who want to do it the right way. And they pass through Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, but not the Guerreros. Oh, no, no, no. Not the Guerreros. They had to sneak in through under holding a donkey coming through the Rio Grande up to Mexico. And, and he just destroys the Guerrero family. He destroys the, you know, the family insulting them. And off to the side is Chavo, Eddie and Chavo Jr., Watching this, watching JBL rip into the family with the words I wrote, right? So yeah. you're a little uncomfortable, right? But John is such a pro tearing into it, it's great. And afterwards, the girls come up to me, Eddie comes, hugs me, goes, That was amazing. Please, please write for me. And Chavo, both Chavos are good, great. <laughs> they, know, they know how to get heat. So I said, Eddie, you know, that, that she wants to keep me a hands from away from you, but. I was always working Eddie on the slide and stuff. And when we did that, that show, it was JBL, and it was um, it was a it was Summer Slam, the show in Los, Los Angeles. I worked that show. Where it was a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath. Yeah. I was think that could have been could have been No Way Out, was it? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was in Los Angeles, and I mean, I followed after I was sitting ringside a little back, and I followed the blood backstage where Eddie was. You know, it was just mm -hmm. it was just. Like, Incredible bloody match, but um, this two guys at the top of the game, literally giving lit, no no pun intended, leaving all the ring. Not an exaggeration. They literally bled out in the ring. It was an amazing match to be part of. Uh, so I really loved to work with both those guys. Eddie was just—I mean, I dedicated my book to Eddie. The nicest, he was literally, literally. I mean, it's just like the nicest guy in the world. You know, it's just yeah. I've only heard, I've only heard uh, positive stories about him. Let's talk about when you when Vince said that it's your hill to die on. Was was this moment your hill to die on? Was it? Oh. Was, was was he involved? You know, um, yeah. You know what? Yes, yes, and no. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wish I'd seen that picture like a month before, a week before. Yes, I'm gonna yeah. get nightmares again. Um, that's John Heidenreich, and. Yes. Um, we were, like I said, once again, going back to pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope. Um, and I, in my head, I go, wrestling is story. It's good guy versus bad guy. Heel yeah. versus baby face. And, you know, you have the ultimate good guys going the white hats. And you get the ultimate bad guys. So the ultimate bad guys in life, more or less, the, like the fascists, the Nazis. I mean, really, I mean, if, who's going to defend the Nazi? You can, let's, this is the bad, baddest of bad guys. Let's make him a heel. But not just yeah. any Nazi. Let's make him a frozen Nazi because frozen Nazis are much better than unthought, you know, thought out Nazis. <laughs> so, and I sit there and I watched all these horror films. Like I watch, you know, I grew up watching The Frozen Dead with Dan Andrews. I watched Shockwaves and Peter Cushing. All these films were the big, you know, Oasis of the Zombies. And so the idea of like, you know, um, a frozen Nazi coming back from the dead, perfect, makes perfect sense in wrestling, right? Why doesn't it work? Yeah. So I, I said, like, how about this, Vince? We have this like. It's 1945, it's the end of the war, it's in the French Alps or Italian Alps, Swiss Alps, any Alps you want. And there's a cave with some Nazi scientists, because they're all nefarious, and they they make the prototype, this one frozen Nazi, this uber-Nazi uber called Baron von Bava, and they'll freeze them, and they forget about him. Because that's what you do, you forget about the frozen Nazi for 50 years. And then they thaw him out, and he comes back, he comes into SmackDown, because that's where Nazis go, SmackDown, and that's the whole gimmick. It would be like a frozen Nazi, and... Um, and I thought in my head, as I explained to Vince, as I'm doing now, hey, this is a good idea. This can't go wrong. And I'm thinking, you know, Nazi villain, because they had many Nazi characters, villains in the 50s and 60s in wrestling. Yeah. They had guys with, David Schultz wore a swat stick. I go, so when did all of a sudden that we can't offend the Nazis now? I mean, what? <laughs> what are they off limits, right? So I said, you know what's going to really win this over? You know how Vince is really going to say, that's a great idea, Dan? If Dan gets up and marches around the room with goose stepping, going like this, singing Dushlin Uberalis, because I just want to get the point home, right? I said, Fitz, picture this, right? And I go up there and I start doing my, my best SS goose step and picture this walk. And looking back in hindsight, you know, not I shouldn't have got out of the chair. 
And I remember Vince turning to look at Vince. He looked at me like that moment you look at just before, just before the train hits the car. It's a moment of abject fear, but you can't. He's like, his eyes are open, his mouth's starting to open like a gape. He's like, he didn't say anything. He just got up and he went to the, got his briefcase and he got his jacket and he turned to the door and he stopped. He turned to look, he looked back in the room at me, opened the door and walked out. Never said a word. Never said a word. Ed Kosky goes to me, he goes, that's a first in company history. And I said, I guess so. And like, so that story died in the room. But 20 minutes later, it's on the dirt sheets. Someone had leaked it out from the team and the frozen Nazi, the Nazi girl, whatever they want to call it, that, you know, that, that leaked out. And people have come to me out. Yes, I go, yeah, I just, it's a good idea. Listen, it's pro wrestling. If you can't, if you can't bring the worst out in people, this is the worst villain. We're going to beat him. Someone, mm. some virtuous guy is going to beat him. You know, you can't take it seriously. Of course, it's not real. It's a frozen Nazi, for Christ's sakes. Yeah. But, you know, if you can, and I said to Vince, he, that's when he said, pick you, hold a die on. I said, Vince, mm. if you, I can't push the envelope. Why am I here? Yeah. Why, why uh, this, this, this happened shortly after the, the Hero Hito Ooh, thing. That's, well. that's, that's, yeah. I'm st I was still looking at my wounds over that one, by the way. That's a little preference. We had, yeah. um, Kenzo Suzuki, come on. Yes. He came from Japan. He he came with his wife and another fellow, but it was um, it was mostly Kenzo, and I think mm -hmm. Hiroko was the wife, and she did the whole white face Isha thing. And and he was a good sized guy, six something, six, maybe six six. But I said, Vince, you know, we've done the Yakuza thing, we've done the samurai thing. It's all kind of like, you know, we 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 kind of trapped with that in the that Asian world. Let's do something different. So I said, you know, once again, I look back, maybe I should have kept my mouth shut. Let's I go, Vince, picture this. It's a screen. It's an atomic explosion, right? And the A bomb's going off, and there's the big mushroom clouds coming, billowing up in the air. And these two Asian eyes come out of the come out of the mushroom cloud, and you see Hirohito is coming. And I started talking like out of the rubble of a great proud nation comes the bronze warrior to avenge his people. It's family Zona. It's Hirohito. He's the emperor's like grandson. I, you know, I'm riffing it by the way as I'm going telling you. Yeah. He's loving it. God damn, that's good stuff, Dan. That's any stunts. And I said, we'll get Japanese kettle drums, and 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 Vince went with it. So he bought archival footage of the like the next day in Hiroshima. They made this. They made this whole promo, uh, this whole gimmick. It was a whole B-roll thing. It was um, and there's no wrestling in it. It looked like something out of like the World of War. There's like you know Japanese footage of bombs going off and just anarchy. And then at the end, when the atomic bomb goes off, someone took a bucket of blood and they threw it onto the screen and said. And the blood, Hirohito's coming. And I was watching that backstage with some of the boys on uh, Raw, and they're going, what the hell is this? And I go, <laughs> no, there's no wrestling in it. And we don't know. I said, it's a whole new concept, right? This is great. I'm I'm the golden boy again. I'm 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 back in Vince's good graces. That lasted like eight hours. Because the next morning he, he shows up. We don't talk about Hirohito. We don't mention Hirohito. It never happened. I'm like, I gotta know what's going on. Well, I'll tell you what's going on. Apparently, the Japanese royal family's pissed off at us. They're gonna sue us and kick our boys out of Japan. I go, hold on, hold on. I said, there's a Japanese royal family. He goes, yes, there is, apparently. And they watch wrestling and they're fucking mad at us. I go, well, I didn't know. He goes, well, you, I, you told me to do it. I go, you're the boss. You, why'd yeah. you? He goes, why do you listen to me sometimes? And this is the boss yelling at me, right? I said, so the Japanese didn't like the fact that we came with this character and stuff. And it was just one of these crazy. I said, listen. You know, uh, we won the war, and so at the end of the day, that, <laughs> that character gets scrapped. That was a one-time thing; gets scrapped. And then I, I should have learned. I should have learned they stay after World War II Axis powers you know, gig because that's why you know Hirohito failed, and you know then uh, Heinrich failed, the Nazi failed. I was going to go for a Mussolini character later on if I had gone for three for three. You know, it's been a cool <laughs> time. Good, you know, but like I said, you got to push it. You got to push it, or don't show up. You know, don't yeah. show up. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I, could, I got to fight once, but I couldn't. I was talking to Vince once. He said, "Take something down." And I'll, in all honesty, I can't. I can't spell. I'm like, yeah. this is awful. It's awful. So he said, "Read this back to me." And I read back 99% what he said to me. I was off one or two things. Yeah. God damn it! That's not what I said, Dan. I said, "I know," but this is the gist of it. That's not what I said completely. I said, "I know," and he said it again. I said, "Jesus Christ! Did you hire me as a writer or as a fucking stenographer? Because I can write this stuff." You know, so, you know, I, I was like, I, I get pissed at that, you know, but we back, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it was like, you know, okay, don't get too pissed, you know, because he's still your boss. Yeah. You know? 
that's why I got you on today to tell some of those mad stories, like because I think they they'll go to waste, like if we if we didn't have you on again to tell them. Wow, like, yeah, crazy. Like, generations now they take up these tapes in the future generation. Oh, what type of culture they have in America? Oh, this is great but, stuff. But to be fair, before your time, there was a lot of controversial shit that happened in wrestling as well. Oh, yeah. Not so, not so much afterwards, but that's because of the way fucking society has got. Yeah, I think I think it's. I mean, like I said earlier, not not joking. I mean, um, there's nothing that I could have. Um, very few things I would have pitched that would have gone over today. Uh, it was this this over hypersensitivity to everything? Um, yeah. You got to realize. I mean, we're storytellers. Whether it's wrestling, or whether you're doing a graphic novel, or you're doing a movie, we storytellers. And to put confines on us, to put parameters, to put like, like to say, you could say this and this, but you can't say this. Why bother? Yeah. I mean, this, this yeah. creative restrictions as an artist takes. But then when you get societal restrictions, you can't do anything. It's like you know, you don't tell me what to do. I mean, if you're making a film budgetarily, you don't have a lot of money. You you create barriers yourself to be creative, because you have these you're hamstrung by whether budget or time. But what society tells you one thing, that's a different story altogether. Then I can't be creative at all. Like Dave Chappelle has to watch what he has to say. He's a comedian. He's a show, he's a social commentator on things. You can't censor comedy, in my opinion. Yes, you shouldn't censor anything. Yeah. You shouldn't censor anything. If something bothers you, turn the page, I'll watch it. Turn the knob, shut the TV off. Because after a while, everyone's gonna find something offensive. Mm -hmm. You're going to find something offensive. That's just the way pe people that they're going out of the way to be upset, to be hurt. To be, uh, it's this badge of honor now being ultra woke. You know, yeah. shrug it off. You hurt someone's feelings. I don't hurt someone's feelings, but at the end of the day, get over it. It's yeah. a joke. It's a bit, you know, look at it in context. But people are pulling things out of everything. When you stop pulling things out of context, everything's going to crumble. Yeah. I'm going to give you the screen right now. And, <laughs> and you're going to tell me what you've got going on in your life, what you got coming up, and where people can follow your work. Okay, um, as we said earlier, I've got, if this was, was three, a month later, I've got three projects that I've been involved in. Uh, I've had to sign NDAs, which are non-disclosure agreements, non-disclosure things, but one of them is, is in the world of wrestling, which I can't seem to get out of. Uh, that's coming, it's something I've been working on for a while. It's coming to fruition. I'm working with a dear friend of mine, and hopefully it's coming to an end with the world of um, our project is coming to a head through roller derby. And that's which has always been the cousin of wrestling. It's wrestling with wheels and stuff. So I'm working with Danny Wolf, who is someone I think you should get on the show. A good friend of mine. Um, we get some, we're working on something together. And then um, I I pitched an idea to a friend of mine who's a director for a, an idea for a miniseries, and he really loved the idea. It was just me talking. Hey, here's, here's an idea. But I was thinking about doing something like this. Blah, 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 blah. I just threw an idea out there. He responded well. He talked to his friend about it, who's a who's a big producer and. They wanted to hear the story. And I said, what story? I was just talking. I was just talking out loud. And they thought I had an idea for a concept. So I sat back. I came up with a concept for a different story. I put together, I put a pilot together. I'm working on a pilot now. I've written the pilot. I've done the Bible, the story Bible. So it's a real. And people have really responded well to it, uh, really well. So I've got some backers now uh, who really want to see this project come to fruition. So that's where I am right now. So I these three projects I'm working on plus a few other things that are keeping me busy all the time, you know, and, and once they come, once the final paperwork's done and once something is done, I could say, this is this, this is this, but you know, but since last you've seen it, I, I write all the time. Like everyone else is the business you write. And, you know, sometimes it's for not something falls by the wayside, but you know, even if something doesn't get picked up and made, the writing process makes you a better writer. It should make you a better writer. Hopefully it'll make me a better writer. You know, I mean, it, it seems to be determined yet. Um, so I've got these projects I'm working on, and once one comes to fruition, once I can, I can not break the contract, but at least I can talk about it publicly, then I can come on and talk, fill it in more, you know? Yeah, I'd love that, because exactly, like, you know from the stuff I put online that I don't just stick directly to wrestling. No, it's just great. And, and, and because I, I don't want to be, there's so many wrestling podcasts that you don't want to just jump into that one, and I... I can tell you that wrestlers are not very reliable at times for interviews and things like that. So it's not good to have it. people. Yeah, it's it's good to have people, but they're busy guys as well. And you have yeah, to remember, yeah, there's a yeah, fucking yeah. there's a fucking million wrestling podcasts, and they're getting asked for maybe hundreds a day. So yeah, like, I yeah, understand but, where they're coming from. And I like the, the format you've done because I think people that watch wrestling, it's a similar demographic who watch horror movies, who like heavy metal shows or punk music. Yes. You know, yes. who watch roller derby, you watch 
So this you this is Venn diagram like I like this, I like this, I like this because you go to a wrestling show, you see guy ten guys wearing mis misfits t shirts, and getting misfits concert guys wearing the Ric Flair shirts. So there's always a crossover, cross pollination, and I think once again it's the people that like um. The subcultures, the extreme of subculture, like metal, um, wrestling, and horror. I think those exactly are that's the holy trinity. That literally, and I've yeah. worked on all three. So basically, that's you know, I've I've done everything your parents tell you not to do. I've done I did the whole <laughs> white trash and the white trash I've done. Um. So, but I think I think the thing about all those fans, whether it's you know, um, heavy metal, punk, horror, wrestling, uh, the the one connective tissue for the fans, it's passion. They're passionate about what it is. They know it. They're passionate, and they'll they'll go with it. And they're forgiving. If a, if the, if a wrestling promotion or tries a gimmick, it fails. The fans will acknowledge it and they'll go with it. And they could be forgiving. You know, if one album's bad, you know, they look back. They don't judge it in the whole thing. You know, if one concert doesn't work out because they understand the venue, they understand the art form, and they go for it. So they're very compassionate and they're very uh, passionate about the music, the wrestling, the movies. Um, because if you look at horror films, they're they just had a horror convention. There's their horror conventions, Monster Palooza, Son of Monster Palooza. They don't have the, any other genre. There's no other genre that has it. So yeah. wrestling, horror, heavy metal, it's the same, it's the same formula, I think. It's the same, these people have the same DNA. You know, and they like that extreme stuff. They like that stuff to, to the edge. And I think that's um, why I've been in all three of them. It's sort of like yeah. it's it's called me as a kid. And this is that as a kid, I was influenced by all three. And ironically, I've never grown up. Emotionally, so I'm still in the you know, in the phase of like trying to figure out what I'm trying to do in my life. Mm. And I, ironically, I've thrown kind of Tiger King into the mix in, on my That's channel amazing. as well, that which is crazy. crazy. I, I I had a Joe Exotic impersonator on uh, the yes. other day, at, <laughs> and and man, I looked at my Instagram story, and the real Joe Exotic's lawyer has been like watching my things, uh, John Phillips, which is crazy. That, and I had another. I had another Tiger King guy on that's coming out next week. Um, but it's it's funny that these like big shots are watching these things as well. It's funny. Well, the thing about your show when we met like two almost two years ago, I mean, we're just two guys. We're, we're two fans. Yeah, we're two fans sitting down, you know, having a drink two, four thousand miles away. By the, you know, but we all the same. We have that same thing that connects us. You know, we we watch wrestling, we watch things, and. And this is a certain brotherhood there and sisterhood too. A lot of women, you know, enjoy this stuff because we like we like this way of storytelling. We like this way of lifestyle, and um, there's more compatibility. People have more, you know, there's more diversity within you know the horror wrestling rock stuff than there is outside outside the world. People come together for one reason. You know, you know why you're going to see wrestling. You know why you're going to a horror movie. There's a collect when you watch a horror movie in a dark, dark, you know, theater. That's a tribal feel of you know collectivism. We all held together. Re living this horror, the relief of it together. It's something very around the campfire type of thing from thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. So wrestling, wrestling is almost like sacrificial to some people. If you think of some of the matches, it's like watching some sort of sacrificial altar. That ring becomes something special. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dan, listen, it was an absolute pleasure to catch up with you today, man. And hopefully we'll get to chat in about a month's time when I will, as soon as it shit gets, can I, come out. I can't wait. Oh, well, of course I want it to come out. But yeah, I mean, I, right now, I guess um. I've signed things I can't really. I could hint around stuff, but and also too the way it goes in life. Sometimes you're right at the edge, and someone throws a monkey wrench, and it falls. I mean, it's happened to me before. Every yeah. everyone I know, the business something. If something's gone well, boom. And wait till just, that light. Wait till that light is truly green. Wait until the check. I don't fuck if they film it. I want that check in the bank. Yeah. I want my. I want my check. I even opened a new account. I want that check in my name and the account, and then knock yourself out. That's how it goes. Yeah. Thanks a million, man. You're welcome. Good luck to the family. I hope to talk to you soon, brother. Take care. You too.